morning, church. God bless you. Happy, happy Sunday. What a day. We are so grateful. I hope you were able to make it for the ribbon cutting and the grand opening of our East Campus. We have many great people here, some distinguished guests. I want to thank the mayor for being here. I want to thank the, the Chamber of Commerce for being here. Yes, you can give them a applause. Very, very cool. That's, that's a big deal. We have some new friends. We met some sitting right on the back row behind my daughter over there, and, and, and lots of people. We've had pastors show up. And uh, I give you greetings from Pastor Steve and from Diane. If you guys are watching, we love you. They were really, really, really hoping to be the surprise guest today to help us with the dedication, but uh, he's not quite feeling up for that yet. So keep praying for him. Uh, Pastor Steve, we love you. We wouldn't be here without you and Diane and all you guys' hard work. So God bless you. We love you. Have a good day. All right. Let me ask you guys a question. Have you ever had a time in your life where you had expectations that were here and then the cold dose of reality came in somewhere around here. Yeah, I said, testify, I hear it. We all have those, right? We're like, I'm so excited, this, this event or this day or this, is, this, insert the blank here, is going to be awesome. And you've got these high expectations and then sure enough, reality comes in and just throat punches you. And you're just like, that was not what I was expecting. You know what I'm talking about? If you don't know, just get on Facebook or get on any social media feed or go to Pinterest because it is awesome. Because, you know, you get inspired. You think, I'm going to do something really, really exceptional. I'm going to step out of my comfort zone. For instance, how hard can it be to make something like this? This is the ex Everybody loves Count Olaf, right? You got to, how hard can it be? You get your little ingredients and your, your condiments and <laughs> your cement, whatever it is that you do to make these kind of things. I'm a little out of my depth here. And you think, how hard can it be? So here's the expectations, and here is the reality. That's, that's, that's actually my thing. I made that. So No, I'm kidding. I didn't. But this is what we do. We, ha we have these expectations. We, you know what? I'm not going to get bitter about this. I'm going to go again. I'm going to get better. So we have our expectations for the next one, and we're fired up. Thomas the Train, so cute and cuddly. Surely this has got to be easier. And then we're slapped in the face when reality shows up and we meet that. <laughs> What is that? And we think, oh, it's just not coming together. I was thinking this. Or maybe you know the holidays are coming and you want to get that perfect, beautiful picture for the holidays. You know, you're just, oh, it's just so adorable. Yes, it is. So cute and cuddly. How hard can it be to get a baby to sit still in a little tiny dump truck? Well, the reality shows up and that's kind of, you know, <laughs> that's more like it. Or this one here, you're ready for Christmas and you're so fired up. It's so cute. You know what? I don't have to go let the pros do that. We can do that in our backyard. Put a little black sheet up. Cousin Eddie's going to bring over the light bulbs. We're going to have a great time. And the little lights aren't twinkling, Clark. And we're going to wrap them up. And this is what happens when we do it. That's, <laughs> that's it. Now, you can be bitter about that. And that's normal. Or you can be better. The choice is yours. I had a very personal time growing up when I could be bitter or better. How many have siblings? Raise your hands if you have brothers or sisters. Oh my goodness. All right. Let's see. Who is the oldest of the siblings? Okay. All right. Everybody look around. These are the responsible ones. These are the ones that had to, right? You know what I'm talking about. That's why you're laughing. All right. How many were the baby of the family? All right. Now you look around. These are the perfect ones, right? You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, see, right? Boo. And the older ones are booing because that's what they hear all the time. They're the perfect. What I really meant to say, they're the spoiled ones. That was me. I was the baby. Now raise your hand. May the Lord help you if you were the middle child. Ow! Oh, yes, yes. And that's why we pray for them. <laughs> every, every middle child is different and, and, and special in their own way. God loves them. They're good. When I grew up, here's a picture of my brothers. This is uh, me with Tim and Jeff. I think we have a shot of it. There we go. Yes. There's little old me. Little pastor, I was already prepping my happy, happy, you know, chilly look with my thumbs up. This is my middle brother, Tim, and that's my big brother, Jeff. Usually, the day would involve something happens between me and Tim, and I would run and hide behind my big brother, Jeff. That middle brother, though, oh, he knew what would make me better, and he knew what would make me bitter. See, I have a confession to make. My name is Matt, and I'm addicted to ice cream. You're supposed to say, hi, Matt. It's okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You can tell me your, your, your struggle later. I'm addicted to ice cream, and my brother knew that, and I love ice cream in any way, shape, or form. And one day, I'm seven years old, and he comes to me, sweet middle brother Tim, I hope you're watching, comes with a bowl of ice cream. 
and he gives it to me. And I'm like, well, this is different. Maybe we're going to we're going to bond. This is it. This, this is a blessed event. So I take the spoon and I grab it and I chomp down on it. And it wasn't ice cream. It was nasty room temperature margarine. <laughs> margarine. He even had like an ice cream scoop to make it look like ice cream. Like, like how, how sick is that that you go and you torment your baby brother? So I was kind of bitter about that, but I got over it. So four days later, he came back with another bowl of ice cream. Oh, ho, ho, ho. fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, Tim, shame on me. Because that means I fell for it again. So I was skeptical, as you would be too, right? Nobody wants another mouthful of margarine or butter or whatever that was. So he comes to me and he says, Matt, I promise, this is, this is, <laughs> we're going to bury the ax. I promise, this is not margarine. And he came in and I said, I'm not eating that, bro. Seven years old, he's tormenting me, and he says, look closely. I promise, I'm not going to do that to you again. He even had Hershey chocolate syrup on it and sprinkled lightly salted peanuts. It's my favorite, it's tin roof, right? And we love those. I mean, I could be on the biggest diet in the world and losing like 20 pounds, and I'm not going to eat ice cream. And Amy comes, you want a tin roof? Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do. I'll take a hop. So Tim hands it to me, and I'm like, I'm still not buying it. Even though it, it looks good, I touched the chocolate. It's chocolate syrup. Surely this is going to meet the expectations I have. Surely, the, nope, it's Tim. It's my middle brother. I'm not buying I push it away, and he says, would it make you feel better if I ate some first? Well, yeah, it would, actually. So he took the spoon, and he had a huge heap, of, and he ate it. So I was mm, so good. I said, that's all the proof I need. And I grabbed that spoon out of his hand, and I tore into that. And he was right. It wasn't margarine. It was worse. It was hot, sour cream. <laughs> now think, think about this. Add this together. He ate some of that just to prove to me, just to hook me in. How sick is that? How sick? You know what? I didn't know if I could be madder at him or mad at me for falling for it again. What is wrong with me? Now, I had an option there. I could be bitter about that. You know, but I'm not. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of over it. 40 years later, I'm still dealing with that. I'm in therapy for it. But what do you do when your expectations don't match up? And what does the scriptures give us? What does the Bible say about this? When your reality doesn't match your expectations, you have a choice. You can become bitter or you can become better. Let me show you what this looks like in font form. Now, if you're not sure what this means, picture this. Someone can come to you with a glass of lemonade. But what you really find it is, is it's bitter lemons. So what do you do in life? When you have these expectations and you're thinking it's going to be this and you're so fired up and the next thing you know, you're handed lemons. You have a choice. And that's what we're going to dive in today. Our big question for us today, what do you do when reality doesn't match your expectations? Because being bitter is our natural response. Let's be honest. When things don't go our way, we usually don't sing a happy song. And a little blue sparrow lands on our shoulder and says, everything is awesome. We don't do that, right? You're safe here. You can nod with me. It's not just me, right? Okay, all right. It's awful lonely up here. We get a little cranky, a little fussy. If we haven't eaten, we get a little hangry when things don't go our way. And we have a choice. We can go down the road to bitterness or we can fork and go down the road to betterness and trust God's plan. I can think of no better example in Scripture other than the Lord than perhaps the Apostle Paul, with his thorn in the flesh. Now, you want to talk about something that hounds you, that gave him every reason in the world to be bitter? That's what we're going to explore today. So go ahead and open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, or pull up your favorite Bible app, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. While you pull that up, let me welcome our online campus. It's great to have you with us as well. And if you're a first-time guest and you're checking us out like from a safe distance online, special welcome to you. And for our guest here today, we have a gift for you. Thank you for being here. See Miss Shannon here in the Welcome Center when you leave. And if you've got younglings, make sure the little young Jedis get their goodie bag too, okay? We want to make sure you know that you are welcome here, and we thank God that you're here today. All right, so let me set the context for what we're looking at, because Scripture without context is kind of a weird thing. Always, always, always know the historical context and the theological context of a passage. Paul here has found himself with a thorn in the flesh. 
Now, what's weird about this is the Bible doesn't define what the thorn is. We think we know. Some scholars think he had bad eyesight because he had these little cryptic references. See, I, Paul, signed my letter. Look with what big letters I signed my name. So they thought maybe he had a weeping eye or he couldn't see or his eyesight was going bad. That would make preaching and preparing things and writing letters to the churches pretty tough. Some thought he had epilepsy, that in the middle of speaking, he would suddenly and unexpectedly be thrown to the ground in a seizure. How hard would that be to be the great apostle and the super apostle and preach God's word? Man, that would be terrifying. Others say, no, it was neither of those. He actually had bad arthritis, and his knees were so bad, it was like bone on bone, and he could hardly walk, and everywhere he went, he was hobbled. And imagine that in a culture that didn't have any planes, trains, or automobiles. There was no way to get around in that. There was no Del Griffith shelling these shower curtain rings trying to raise money for Uber. He had no bicycle. He had nothing, and he had to walk around. So no matter what the thorn was, we know he didn't like it. We know it hobbled him. We know that it was heavy on his heart because he mentions it. And he mentions he prays about it, not once, not twice, but three different times. And you're going to love God's answer. See, Paul was just like us. He had amazing highs. Things were going so well for Paul. He was having a great career. Things were going so good, and then they weren't. And then things would get better, and then he'd get shipwrecked. And then things would get better, and then he'd get beaten. And then he'd get mugged. And then he would have all these ailments. And he had these highs where he was being given revelations that no one ever had before, revelations of heaven and deep truths that no one had ever been shared before. And things were going so great, and then he was having a low point. And what we're going to read today is one of his low points. And aren't you glad that he wasn't perfect, that he shows us it's okay to struggle? It's okay to be down? It's okay, dare I say it? Oh, man. He so many things, and then we wonder why people don't come to us for help. This needs to be a place for healing. Loud. And he's got something going on. Pick up verse 7. Read with me. He says, I was given a and keep me. I begged the Lord. The very first thing he did earnestly. When you're not sure what's be an inch towards that, he stopped and prayed. Say he pleaded. God is good, God is good. And we, and we wonder why we don't have any spirit. No, cool. God hears his prayers and says, Paul, I hear you. Thorn, be gone. And Paul went able to dance around and the... D- no? Oh, have you read this part? No. He doesn't take the thorn away. Paul doesn't get to go around and sing everything's happy clappy. In fact, if you read the next verse, look what God says. He says... My grace is all. Power works best where? In weakness. Ow. Be honest, okay? It's realville. We're allowed to be real here. Would you like to beg somebody for something three times and that be your answer that you get? Can you imagine? Baby, I need you to do this. Can you please do that? I need you. No, be weak. <laughs> Would you like negative ghost rider? The pattern is full. You would not like that. That would be something that you would be like, whoa, 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 did you not hear me? Did you not hear my earnestness? We could easily even become bitter. When we started this church, some of you have been here long enough, and you remember Pastor Rumley when we were this, this, this tag team thing going on, and, and if you didn't understand him, he came from a football path. The only man I know who loves football more than I do, Roll Tide, God bless Alabama, America. This is one of the things that I remember about him, some of his earliest days. And I couldn't find a picture of him playing football. But I could find this gym right here when we dressed up like football players, and we had a great time. We were, here we are flexing. If you don't remember this, he was the star quarterback for Elon University. And in his honor, I have just a little, a little illustration here. I'm going to try to throw this to the back. I'm just kidding. This is, this is <laughs> to remind us of Pastor Steve in his Elon days. And he was a star quarterback, and he had it all. Think about this. He had size. He had speed. He had a sharp mind where he could come to the line of scrimmage, check the defenses, and say, nope. And call an audible the line of scriptures. He could read defenses. He was so quick. And there's no doubt in my mind that he was going pro. And that was going to be his career. Until a cheap shot. After he had thrown a ball, some person 
tackles him illegally, drives him into the ground, and shatters his collarbone. And his career is gone. Like that. Now, he could have been bitter, or he could be better. See, he had a choice right there. Imagine that. That's what you do. That's who has been, especially, we're bad at this. We put our identity in what we do, don't we? Yeah, all the ladies are nodding. Yes, yes. We get bad about that. Think about this. I am so glad that he allowed God to make his story better. I don't know about you, but God changed it. And because of that, he becomes a pastor and a spiritual mentor for so many of us and touched countless lives. And he could have been bitter. You know people who had. But he was presented with the fork, and he went God's way. Notice the second thing Paul does. Paul says, you can listen for God's voice. See, the first thing was he fervently prayed. He begged God. And then he listens for God's voice. When you're praying, you're more likely to hear God's voice. And when we hear God's voice, guess what? We get to sense his leading. You need an answer for your life? You need a direction? You got to spend time not only praying, but also listening. See, prayer is a dialogue. It's not a monologue. It's not you telling God, I need this, I need this and this, this, check it off. That's not God. That's a genie. (laughs) Just go rub a lamp if that's all you need. God wants us to listen. And we be still in his presence, and we can hear God's voice, because he may change your circumstance. He may remove your thorn, or he may say, you know what? This is going to stay with you for a little bit. But it's okay, because I have a plan. And if you trust me with your life, I'll make something beautiful out of it. But don't take it back. Put it in my hands and leave it here. That's what Paul did. It's amazing the maturity he has. And we can claim promises like we know all things work together for good and we like to stop there. But that's not what it says. Finish it out. It says to all those who love God and are called according to whose purposes? His. Not my purpose. God, please bless my mess. No, no, no. We're supposed to be on his page, his ambassadors. When we sing things like I surrender all, we're supposed to actually mean that. Not I surrender some. (laughs) 62%. Woo. And see, Paul's coming along, and he's saying, listen, God's grace is sufficient for me. And you know what? That's okay. God, if that's what you choose, and then he leads us to the next step. And I love what he does. He accepts the reality, and he finds the good in it. Wow. Man, let's be honest, guys. Is that easy to do? That is so hard. That is so, so hard. Be honest, we don't like to do that. Sometimes it's easy to, you know, we talked about this Wednesday night with the storms. How do you trace that rainbow that's hiding in that storm? It's there, but you can't look at the storm and let that be your, your whole perspective. You look beyond it, and then you look through it, and you see where God is taking you. What a godly perspective. This is, this is incredible how he, how he shows us this. When you come to the fork, do you fork left and go to bitterness, or do you fork right to betterness? Look how Paul handles this. Look at the next verse. He says this. So here's what I'm going to do. Now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. All right? Buckle up for verse 10. Here we go. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses, in the insults, in the hardships, in the persecutions, and the things I troubles to suffer for Christ. Are you kidding me? Who does that? Then he finishes his, for when I'm weak then I'm strong. Wow, this guy gets it. Think about that. That is the high watermark for us as Christians. You want to go deeper in your life? There it is. (laughs) When the trials come and the tribulations, he takes joy in them. Can I ask a question? As your friendly neighborhood pastor, how are you doing with that? Because I must confess, sometimes I'm not so good with that. If you ever rode with me when I'm driving, why are you laughing, honey? That's, there are people that shouldn't be on the road. And I thank you, Louise. And I don't rejoice. I confess. My kids don't hear me say, praise the Lord, another idiot driver. <laughs> you know? But Paul rejoices at these things. Man, he's so steady and he's so stable. And I love his perspective. It's all in how you view it. Anybody watch football way back in the glory days? You might recognize this guy. This is Vince Lombardi. And it's, woo, hey man. Vince Lombardi, the famed Green Bay Packers coach. Well, he was notorious for funny quips, little short little pearls of wisdom that were hilarious. And one day, his team loses, and they get trounced. And the, the reporter comes up and says, Mr. Lombardi, tell us, how did it feel to lose? 
guess what he said? This, y'all write this down. This is classic. He looks at the board and goes, lose? Huh. We didn't lose. We just ran out of time. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? What a great perspective. It's delusional, but what a great perspective. <laughs> Think about that. He just looked at the scoreboard. Like, we just ran out of time. We could have done it. Think about that. That's one way of looking at it. You could become bitter, church, or you can become better. You can't control what comes your way. You can't control that phone call that comes at 3 in the morning. You can't control that pink slip that says, sorry, thanks for your 35 years. Here's a nice watch. It's a Casio. You can't control that, but you can. You can control how you react to it. And that's what Paul is saying here, which leads us to the ultimate and the final lesson from Paul. You can use your hardship for God's glory. Wow, this is so powerful. Whatever ailment Paul had, whatever that thorn was, and we don't know until we see him in glory, he was determined to use it for God's glory. That speaks to me. When the bad stuff comes, and it will, man, I want to be found as a man who uses it for his glory. Where people who don't even know God look and say, Man, there's something different about you guys. What is, I, I don't know about this Jesus thing, but I know I want some of what you got. And we could be one beggar, humbly telling another beggar where we found food at the feet of the Lord. And it is a beautiful testimony of using that. This is what Jesus had to do. You want to get really, really real? In his darkest moment, he's there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Disciples, will you pray with me? Yeah, we'll pray with you. And they fall asleep. And he goes and he starts to pray. And he prays one of the most heartbreaking short prayers to his heavenly father. You want to read it? Check out what he says. He says, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And it said he prayed so fervently, so earnestly, he even sweat drops of blood. Think about that. Have you prayed like that? Have I? I mean, this, this, that's fervent prayer. Guess what Jesus does next? He goes away, checks on his disciples. Yep, still sleeping. Appreciate it, guys. And then he goes back, and he prays what we think is the same prayer, but it's not. Look closely. Notice the slight change in this next time he prays. He says, my father, if it's not possible for this cup, this is so good, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. There's the example. May your will be done. He has fully embraced the Father's will over his own personal. I got to ask, how about us? Have we been to that point? You want to talk about freedom? The ultimate detachment from things that try to entangle us in this world to say, Lord, your will be done. When we win, we praise him. If we lose, we praise him. And all the time in between. And he would go on, by the way, to honor the Father and just do a little small thing called the resurrection and save all of humanity, all those who would come to him. That's incredible. I love this. Person. See, sometimes God will leave that thorn in your flesh, maybe an obstacle or two that you've got to overcome. But sometimes he will remove it, or he'll take it and he'll use it for something good, maybe something better than you expected, something beyond what your expectations were. For example, the potter's hand. See, what a lot of us forget is this was not born out of good and happy times. Fifteen years ago, Pastor Steve, his family, my family, we were, we were having, we were hurting. We were in a very dark and tough and trying time for us. All we knew was that God was calling us onward. We didn't know where we'd meet. We didn't know what we'd call ourselves. We didn't know if anybody would show up. We didn't even know what city he was leading us to. We didn't even know what name. In fact, our first attempt at a logo ended up being this horrifying thing, which ends up looking like something from the movie Ghost with Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore doing something weird. This, this might as well be a 1994 piece of clip art. People come by and go, oh, Pottery Barn. Let's go. No, we're not Pottery Barn. We didn't know anything. Now, we could have been bitter. We could have wallowed in our misery and said, <laughs> where's God? That would have been really easy to do. And there were minutes that we might have felt that way. But guess what God did? This is, this is incredible. Out of that season of struggle and uncertainty, God came and delivered us. And ultimately, he gives us all of this. 
Now, if you're new to the potter's hand, or maybe you've joined us and you weren't here for the original, I'll give you the 60-second recap of how we started, okay? It started on a cold winter's morn when we gathered in the basement of a borrowed Christian library in a basement. And if you recognize that guy in the red, my super silky shiny shirt, when I had hair, we still have that banner. And we met there, and we outgrew it like that. And from there, we really upgraded, and we went to, oh, no, yes, we went to the dungeon. A scary, ceiling tile stained, sticky floored middle school cafeteria with spells we can't even identify to this day. There were stuff we stepped in on that place, but God blessed, and we grew. We outgrew that, and we quickly knew we had to move yet again, and we moved even further away to another school that was an elementary school where the furniture was even smaller, and when you sat down, your knees came up to your ears, and it was just so great for comfort. But God wasn't necessarily concerned about our comfort. And from there, we were able to move to our first non-portable location on October 24, 2004. I still had hair. Look what you all have done to me since then. Look at this. From there, God has blessed, and it has continued to grow and become a place where we can love God and love people. And then go serve God and serve people. Where the youngest among us can walk hand in hand with the tallest among us. Ryan, you have that? This was taken just last week. Just last week. This is my daughter. Little two, my daughter's the one on the left. <laughs> little two foot six, Mercy Hope, with six foot six, Archie Wells, one of our leadership elders. It's beautiful. You know where they're walking? They're walking to the East Campus. So that brings us to where we are today. As excited I am about our past, I cannot believe what God is doing. I'm going to show you something. Don't do it yet, Ryan. I'm going to show you a picture. And this is not a high attendance day. This is not Easter Sunday or something. I'm going to show you a picture of what the youth have been dealing with until today. Are you ready for this? This is last Wednesday night. Last Wednesday night. We had to take three pictures and fuse it together, Okay. Over 30 people crammed in that room. We couldn't even get them all in there. That's three. That's a composite because we didn't know how to work the little panoramic thing. You know what I'm saying? So we kind of stitched them together. Think about this. Well, now we have the chance to expand because of your faithfulness. We have been able to do, wait until you see the new children's church auditorium. You got to go see that today. When we finish, go down that hall till you can't go any further. It is phenomenal. Several of you are in here and you've told me again, don't you dare say their name so I won't but they're right here and here and here. And they have worked all night long for hours and hours and hours to put this together, and it is phenomenal. See, now we actually have room. This expanded campus over there has allowed us to take everything that was not needed, everything that was not essential for growth here, and move it elsewhere. Offices, copy rooms, storage, some of the adult classes we've had having to rent week after week next door in the ballet. Now we have space for them. And all of these rooms from wall to wall, all 12,000 square feet, are now able to be converted for children's use and for youth use. And it is phenomenal what God is doing. But hear me, hear me, look to me in the eyeball. Hear me. As great as this is, as exciting as this is, this is not the end of God's vision. Not by a long shot. I'm so fired up, I could jump up and down like a little girl. That'd be weird. Some of you would like to see that. But this is, this is what you need to hear. We are not even close. There are still lost and hurting people in these communities all around us. And they need to hear about Jesus. And we need to have space to be able to receive them. So some of you have come up and said, hey, have we arrived? Can we take a foot off the gas pedal? Is there, can we just bless us for no more, close the door? Thank you, Lord. Can we do that? Can we just settle for a minute? Is the vision, is the vision even needed anymore? To which I say, absolutely, yes, yes. Some of you have continued to give, and I thank you for it. Keep it up. This, we need the vision fund more than ever. Notice we don't call it a building fund. Notice we don't call it a land fund because it's bigger than that. It is whatever God leads us to that next step so that we can ultimately buy that. And we had just enough to be able to start. When this building came open that we said, oh, my goodness, another 5,000 square feet. Think of what we can do. We've been hitting this glass ceiling all the time, this growth cap. And now we can do that because parents come in and they see pictures like 30 kids crammed in one room and they're like, little John, <laughs> nope, <laughs> come on with me. Bunch of creepy people in there. And you don't blame them. You wouldn't do that. 
And you wouldn't show up here and go, oh, thank you for your kids. If you'll just walk them a football field down the way and drop them off and then come back here, trust the strangers down there. Your kids will be fine. So we didn't do that. All of this was converted properly, and it's because of your faithfulness. So yes, embrace the vision is alive and well. Remember, this is not our final destination. It's just the next step to accommodate our growth. And God is doing great things. This has bought us some much-needed space and will help us quit hitting that ceiling. Here's a stat you need to know. 85%, 85% of churches in America are plateaued or declining. Let that sink in. 6,000 churches a year are closing their doors. It's 500 a week. Think about that. That many, if 85%, we are one of the few rare churches that's in the 15% that are growing. That is incredible. But we got to be prepared for that because guess what? Society is growing. And we got to have room. we got to be able to do that. That's why we've added 30 more chairs and then 40 more chairs. And we're trying to find places to do that. And some of you have been so good and generous. Here, take my seat. Oh, here, I'll scoot over. How can I help you in? Do you know you have kids? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We can't be everywhere at once. This is your church. And it takes all of us to take God's vision. And, and the vision he gave me is not just to focus on this building. This is so cool. This is, this is one of the things that drives me nuts as a pastor when I drive by giant church facilities and buildings that sit empty all day long, all week long. And they're used one day a week, and on that day, they're used for maybe two hours. And the lost and drying world drives by and says, man, we need a place for this and this. We could do, oh, nah, can't, they're there. Yep, they're as self-centered as I thought they'd be. And we are changing that. You know what, just opening it up just this week, you know what this has allowed us to do? Just this week, because of your faithfulness, we have been able to finally realize a dream and open not one, but two private schools just this week. One of them is called Tots International. We are hosting it. Oh, my goodness. They are very international. Some of them barely speak English. We have some Russian little girls and boys, little blonde headed running around just like Ivan Drago and Rocky, like, I must break you. And they're coming around, and you're seeing them. they got these little blonde ponytails, and they're so cute. And they come up, and they say, thank you, Pastor, for allowing us to have a school here. God bless you. And guess what? Then they hand us a check as a thank you month after month for meeting. That's called a win-win. Then there's Rising Stars, who's meeting in the very back, another private school for kids with special needs. Several kids in there have autism. And it is glorious to hear them singing and being taught. It is just, it, it has to make the Lord happy. And then we're helping not just one, not just two, but now three other churches. Churches that have been homeless because there is a growing antith. This friction is real, y'all. The public schools are stopping and renewing leases. And churches that used to be able to just rent schools, they're finding that at the end of that year-long lease, they say, thanks, we're done. And they're not doing that anymore. And there's people that are homeless. I had one sweet congregation. Guess what? They're meeting right now in that chapel. A sweet African-American congregation pastored by a man named Pastor Julius. He's a little wee little man. And he comes up and he talks and he has this beautiful accent. He says, Pastor Matt, God bless your church. Will you help us? Sure, Pastor, what do you need? We have been meeting in a, like an unair conditioned bay where there's parts being stored. It's like an air conditioning company, 72 degrees. And we're sitting there. I've tried to break the word, Pastor Matt. I open it up and I got God's holy scriptures. And in comes a service man walking with an air conditioner under his arm and he trots right by the pulpit and he grabs his parts and he starts shaking things and hammers and nails and he just bebops right on by, just straight through. And we're all just left. <laughs> what? what was that? He says, Pastor Matt, can you help us? What is we're, we're paying over $1,000 for that kind of thing. Can we give it to your church instead and you let us meet? Yes. <laughs> yes, we can. And they're there right now. I hope you get to meet them. There's a church that comes in after we leave, meets from three to six in here. We dwell together in unity. Y'all, that has to please the Lord. How sweet it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity, when churches work together and realize this is silly. We're not in competition. We're on team Jesus. We're all in this together. So we've been able to do some things and build bridges because here's another thing we're able to host. We're able to finally have a performing arts school. And I'm not talking future. It happened. It started this week. It's Kappa, the Carolina Academy of Performing Arts, where you got ballet and, and acting and dance and, and singing and theater thing. They're putting on a Christmas carol this year. Guess where they're going to do it? 
right here. Right here, they're performing that here. Guess what? They used to have to rent the Halley. But we hold twice what Halley does, and they said, can we come here? Here's a check. I'm like, is the Pope Catholic? Yes, you can come here. Please, come here. How can we help? Guess what's happening? This is hundreds of kids and their families that we're talking about. Every one of them are coming and walking these halls. They're meeting some of our people, which they never would have darkened our doors before. They're seeing our posters, and they're being invited to our events, like the self-defense seminar for ladies coming up, like the Outer Banks fishing trip for men coming up. They may not be interested in Jesus yet, but they are interested in friendships, and they are interested in building bridges, and we are there. See, here's a secret. This, this shames me. Up until 75 years ago, the church was the hub of community life. Did you know that? For a 1,000 years, every great event was held in these walls. Town, town council meetings, city hall, HOA meetings, if they had HOA meetings back in castle medieval times, Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts, Girl Scouts, trail life, you name it. They would come here, and they would feel comfortable here, and then they would stick around and see that Christians aren't weird people. They actually love God and love people, and they would stick around, and they would start to feel comfortable being amongst us and seeing, hey, we're just one beggar telling another where we found food. But in 75 years ago, something happened, and churches began to turn inward and focus on themselves and their programs and their ministries and say, thank you, we're good now. And guess what? The community got the message. And they left. And they started building their community centers. And then we wonder, well, where is everybody? <laughs> Can't believe I just sent the vibe that you're not welcome here. This is supposed to be the hub of life where we come and we rub elbows with each other. And we have changed that precedent because of you. The dream. We didn't have to wait to go buy land. That's coming. We didn't have to wait to build the soccer fields and all the community resources to show people, come on in, the water's fine. That's coming. But this dropped in our lap, and because of your faithfulness and because of contributing to the vision, we were able to do that, and that is what we celebrate today. And it has to make the Lord happy. So I thank you when things get a little crazy, when things get a little messy, because this is being used every day and every night of the week. And I thank you for your patience when things are missing, <laughs> when things get moved, because there's new growth. And you know what? Hospitals are messy and they're loud, and they're chaotic, but guess what? There's new life at a hospital. Gone are the days of this being a museum where it's clean, and it's well lit, but it's dead, full of dead things on the wall. It's not us. And the churches that get that, God is pouring out his favor on them, and that is where we find ourselves today. God knows our dreams. God knows our hopes, but here's the deal. He knows and loves you even more. So is the vision alive? Absolutely. Now more than ever. If you've been contributing, great. Please keep it up. If you've never thought about contributing, may I suggest today is a perfect day to consider it. Pray about it. It's, notice this one line here, that second box. This is above your regular tide. Don't just shift from one, okay? We still got ongoing expenses, and we are right there trying to add some things and some staff. We are right there. So if you've been coming and you've just been sitting, consider helping to pull the wagon with us. We need you. We need you. God is doing great things. He's Lord of it all, or is he really Lord at all? That includes our pocketbook. Pray about it. You don't have to fill out a card. All you got to do is if you want to give, just write vision in the memo or sign it on that little credit card kiosk in the back and just do that, okay? There are great days ahead. Now, as we look at what Jesus did, when he had this, this blood-sweating moment, and his dream was not a dream. It was a nightmare, what he was about to face. I want to notice what God did and leave you with this. Philippians 2 says, He humbled himself, and he became obedient to death, even the death on the cross. This is an innocent man, remember. Look what God does next. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He was exalted. Where he sits today and intercedes for us at the right hand of the Father, Scripture tells us. So let me ask this. Do you know him? Do you know the Lord? Or do you just know about him? 
like I did for many years. There's nothing wrong with that, but you might want to take that next step. And if that's you and you feel the Spirit saying, you know what, there's something, I need, I need that connection. I don't want to be bitter anymore. God, take my life and make it better. I would love, love, love to have a conversation with you. Would you pray with me? Let's bow together. God, I thank you for your presence here. I thank you for being so kind and good and patient with us, even when we were unlovable at our worst. Thank you for not giving up at us and, and being a God of second and third and fiftieth chances. You are so worthy of our worship, Lord. Thank you for your forgiveness. Lord, for those here today that don't know you, I pray, God, that you would soften their hearts and you would just tug at them, just like you did me and so many others in this room, and show us our need for you, Lord. We've made a mess of things, and we invite you to come in and sweep it up. Be our Lord. Be our Redeemer. We confess our sin to you. We know none of us have it all together, so we pray that you would forgive us of our sin. Help us to repent, to walk 180 degrees the other way towards you. Forgive us, Lord. Restore us. Seal us for that permanent day of redemption where we live forever and eternity with you. In Jesus' name we pray.